Shut up and sit down. There's a no, fight no. going on out there, gentlemen. Why don't you get in it? Clear eyes, full hearts. You ready, champ? I've been ready for this my whole life. The Chicago Bears select. Greetings, fans, and welcome into the second edition of uh, the AFDE show supplemental episodes, where basically, usually it'll be just me. Uh, discussing Bears and football, pro and college, uh, starting last week, and we'll go throughout the season. The very first episode, I did my draft profile, how I thought the draft was going to unfold, went into all Bears positions of need, and kind of weeded through it to, to see who ended up being our pick, and we'll get to that shortly, but I will say I was right, uh, so that's always cool. And then, as promised on this show, I'm going to break down all of the all of the picks. We don't need to go into like all 15 undrafted free agents, but there are some ones that I think are are worth mentioning who might actually stick on the roster. But uh, today is episode 34, and uh, we thought it would be extremely special if we could get a friend of ours to join because, as all of you know, number 34 is very important to me, and it's way more important to him. Uh, my friend that I used to work with. On ChicagolandSportsRadio.com back in, as we were just talking, 2010 and 2011, uh, who is now the co-host of Sports Feed on CLTV, WGN, Sunday through Thursday, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m., unless I'm wrong about the Sunday time. Mr. Jared Payton joins the show. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, man. How you doing? I'm doing great, you know. I mean, uh, like we like we were talking about outside of me, I'm standing in my podcast studio, like looking at um, at the mini blinds. Uh, so <laughs> I'm excited that uh, I get a guest and uh, someone that I know will turn out on Bears Talk with me. <laughs> Let's do it, man. I'm excited. I, any time to talk Bears is like good for me. Cool. Well, you know, let's uh, let's catch up uh, real quick too, as well. I mean, I'm, I've been happily following the. Uh, the video footage of uh, of your young boy kicking ass out there on the field, man. It's he's a, I mean, and, oh, and, and he's hitting dingers. Like, I'm not surprised, but how cool is that? Just to, you know, now kind of see it through the lens of what your dad saw when you were playing sports way back in the day. You know what, Jay? It's uh, it's pretty amazing, man. And you know, I I love my son, and I, you know, I think so highly of him. I'm his biggest fan, and I told him that the other day, but. You know, playing a sport and playing it at a high level like I did at soccer, and I played football as well, but I think people forget that soccer was my first passion. Right. Man, like, I I understand the game. I know the game. And to watch him at six years old uh, and do the things that he's doing right now with his footwork, his balance, it amazes me, but it it just goes to show. What doesn't amaze me is I get in rea- a reality check, they works really really hard at being good that's what that's the thing that people think that it's just like this god-given right. ability and yes god god bless him with talent but his work ethic is what is, is amazing to me for a young kid he watches videos and like dribbles around the house and i get mad at him for running around all the time but <laughs> he takes all those moves that he sees from messi and all these other guys and he and he implements them into you know, his game. And to me, that's what's so special. But to watch him grow up is is awesome on the soccer field and baseball, and he's playing all these sports. I just love being that sports dad. Saturdays are my favorite days now, especially in the summertime. I just get to watch him play. And, yeah, now I see what my dad kind of – and how he felt when he watched me play back in the day. Nice. Yeah, it's got to be like almost – you know that competitive part of you that misses playing, but then – like our old bodies being like, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty much good with being a spectator, <laughs> and then double double it up, be, it being your your child uh, performing at a good level. Yeah, man, it's it's pretty crazy because you, you know, as you get older, it gets tougher. And for me, what I, working out is is my passion too. It's what keeps me connected to sports. It's what makes me still feel like an athlete, and you know, taking care of my body and all that other good stuff. And I did a lot of it just because I changed my 
the way that I was living for my kids and my wife because I was just getting too top heavy and my knees were bothering me and I didn't want to be that guy that was, you know, walking around at like 45 years old with a cane or it's hard to get up because I can't because my knees hurt. So I just really like dedicated myself to the gym and keeps me focused. And now I feel like my body feels like I'm like 25. So yeah, man, it, it's, it all brings it back. But people ask me all the time, can, you look like you can still play. Yeah, I look like it, but there's no <laughs> way I'm getting tackled. I do 300 pounds. It's just not happening anymore. No. Well, I'm glad you feel 25. I feel let's maybe 62. I was going to say 65, but I'll, sh- I'll shave three years off. Um, I could thank my parents for the arthritis. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Oh, speaking of which, I told my dad that we were going to be chatting tonight, and he said hello, and it's fun to watch your success and uh, to have fun on our chat tonight. So that's uh, a message from Big Al. Tell him I said hello. And it's just amazing that when you think about the Jared Payton show when we were at uh, Illinois Center for Broadcasting back in the day, yeah. We were, I mean, it was, it was so young and it was so fresh and so new and just being streaming over the internet and just to see, you know, all of, you know, it's funny because we talk about football, right? We talk about Matt Nagy and, you know, coming from the Andy Reid tree and all right. that good stuff. Well, I think about JPS and the tree that it sprouted out and all the people from different that were intertwined in, in that whole entire process and where, you know, people, what people are doing, what they have done. And it's just really cool to have that platform and help, you know, other people like either find their passions or do the things that they love, especially in our business. It, it's amazing to me to see how everybody's grown and how everybody still talks and keeps up and social media helps like keep that all together. Oh God. Yeah, cool. for sure. That's uh <laughs> social media is a big, a big binding factor there. Cause otherwise it's just, families and everything else that's going on i mean we're talking about seven eight years later <laughs> from uh when uh when uh, i i stopped doing the morning show so which that was actually super cool too like the station was new um you were the only show on the whole station and then uh ernie let mccaffrey and i like a couple of knuckleheads do the morning show as a lead into you and then Man, that lasted for like a year and a half. So that was uh, that was probably the brokest I've ever been in my life, but some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. Radio is uh, is uh, challenging, uh, challenging to pay Lincoln Park rent. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's crazy, man, to think about. Man, everybody's grown, and I think that's just part of the process. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, I'm glad that you've changed your uh, your workout routine because you not have you have two two kids to uh, to chase around. How's your daughter doing? My daughter Madison is she's unbelievable, man. She is, and she's an athlete too in the making. She's only two, but her balance and footwork is amazing as well. And she's just a good little girl. It's crazy that you have, you know, my son changed my life because he was my first kid. But right. and being the boy, it, it was awesome. But to have a girl is is so special because man, she it just teaches you how to love all over again and and to know like she, she's so precious man but the one thing i love about her is she's a she's a beast man she will not let bo- any boy talk trash to her she <laughs> will handle her own, and that's what i love she is she's like her mom so i think that's pretty cool she's a mix of my mom and my my wife and so i know she gonna be able to handle her own when she gets older yeah i that's yeah, no one's messing with her if she's that blend. <laughs> That's yeah, she's she's all set. I mean, like you could still be like scary dad guy every now and again, but it'll be funny that when she doesn't need it. <laughs> um, two things I want to ask about before, and then we'll we'll jump into the bears just because um, I kind of you know I've been following from afar, and I think I even texted you about this too. Um, I don't know is the is the beer still going? And I know the coffee is for sure. I I, w- I was not sure about yeah, the beer. The the beer is no longer, but you know it was a, a great process and, and, and an opportunity for me to kind of go through as a young like business owner and understanding the game. It taught me so many lessons for other things that have came after, and then also some of the projects that I'm working on currently right now. So. You know, the coffee kind of sprung off, and it's been so cool because of, you know, being able to come up with a product. And I basically, which I want to tell people is you can do 
you can basically do what you want to do sometimes. You just got to kind of find the ways. Like, you got to find people that help you out, and you need to ask questions and all that stuff. I didn't know nothing about coffee, but I met someone that introduced me to Chris Papa Nicholas from Papa Nicholas Coffee. And next thing you know, you know, we're I've taken a hashtag that I use every morning, which is rise and grind, and putting it on a coffee bag. And I'm just going, how crazy is that? You can take a, a hashtag and turn it into profit. And to be able to do that in a good way to not only provide for my family, but also to give back to my charity and my family's charity, it's just another revenue stream for us to keep doing the things in community that right. we love doing. Because you just know right now the money is not coming into foundation. So trying to find more ways to be able to keep giving back to the youth here in uh, the city of Chicago, it, it's, it's an awesome avenue to be in business and also give back. So. Yeah, those are the two things right now working on, and I got so many top secret things I can't even talk about. But I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, you're always, you're always you're always hustling. Hopefully, <laughs> I got to, I got to, and make sure hopefully when next time that we talk that some of these things are popping off and we can have another conversation. No, that'd be super cool. You know, you just brought something up too that that I think about all the time um, since like we were we were all uh, you know doing the shows back in the day. Like I, I you know, I, I do I'm. I do digital strategy and social media management for a living. And I've been doing that, you know, pretty much since 2012. So when, you know, when I left um, CSR to actually like be able to pay my bills (laughs) and uh, I, you know, I just remember you constantly saying like you were a big advocate of Twitter and obviously that was a good driver for the show and building momentum that way. But you're one of the first people that I had ever talked to who believed it's power for on a business level. You know, you, you weren't just you weren't just tweeting jokes and, and saying things, showing pictures of us sitting in the studio. You know, you were establishing a brand, and I, I just thought that's cool because I think about it now. You know, I as I go to work every day, I'm like, man, I remember <laughs> when when Jared was like, no, man, like this is my brand. <laughs> you know, and I would have never thought about it. I'm just like sending out a couple of that stuff. Well, I'll tell you this: the the reason you know for all that, it, it all started with my space with me and I, I just started to see like the following that you can you can generate just by you know at that time it was really just using a computer but now digitally that we can be on the move and and create on the move with our phones and shoot videos and 4k and I mean all this cool stuff it gives you an opportunity to kind of build your brand and I you know I was just always very aware of it because of my last name and all the other stuff that was going on. But in this new digital world, I was like, man, I got to start carving out my space because in some ways, you know, our parents always tell us, I've heard it so many times. My dad would always tell me like, don't invest in cars, you know, like invest in property, buy a house. And, you know, and I'd be like, wait, okay, okay. But I want the car. I I want the car. Yeah. Can you do both? And then, I started to think about how, you know, the internet was going to become like real estate. And that's just the vision that I, I saw from, you know, you know, back there in like 2009, I would say, I was like, man, I got to start carving this out. But then also too, to be able to have your voice heard. And I think we're, as people, that's what we want. We want to be able to interact with people, but we want to be able to, you know, have our, our feelings heard, our voice heard. And it just gave us a platform to be able to do that. And, you know, being able to, to put out positive things, man. I mean, even at, uh, when we were at Chicago Land Sports Radio, for me, it was, I remember a guy from ESPN was following me on Twitter. And that's the reason how I got the opportunity to go audition for the, uh, the, the show that I was doing, the college football show, the Sports Nation show, and who would ever have thought that just because someone follows you and didn't really know you, but like felt like they knew you through your tweets, that that would give you an opportunity to land, you know, one of the biggest opportunities, you know, in broadcasting business that I've ever done. It gave me an opportunity to do that, and so I just was very, very aware of it. And now we're really starting to see, you know. I see so many people take it to the next level, and I think that it's like sports to me where it pushes you to keep putting out more content, but not just content, but being, putting stuff out that is going to grab people, that's going to, you know, have people come back and look again, and, and it's almost like, you know, having a product. And when you have a product, you know, like a, let's just say a restaurant, yeah, you know, the name outside of it might bring people back, but you want, like, 
the food to bring people back, the, right. the, the, people. the, the service to bring people back. Yeah, the people. And so that's what you want on social media, that people are coming to you every single day. It's almost like a, a TV show or a newscast where, you know, they're stopping in every morning at at 7.30 because they want that rise and grind tweet, and that's what they're waiting for. So I just saw it at a young, a younger age, and now I'm trying to keep building on it and capitalizing on it to be able to get my words out and also just to help as many people as possible and push people to do positive things in our world today. Yeah, Lord knows we need that more on social. It started out as the positive place, but now... <laughs> <laughs> I, it's That's nice when there are, you know, and I, I, I unfollow and try to block out as much as I can, but I mean, it's almost impossible. Uh, so yeah, my Twitter follows, I actually found this software where I bulk unfollowed everybody and then just started choosing people who didn't make me feel like crap, you know, <laughs> it's like, dude, it's not that bad. All right. And you're making it worse on by posting it on social. Is that helping you? You know? So I, uh, I completely agree with you. Uh, also, you, you brought something up, and I wanted to just make sure if anything was going on. You know, I know you have the Jared Payton Foundation and the Walter Payton uh, Charity. Is there anything coming up um, that, that people should know about in the next month or two, something like that? What's the next big thing? Uh, the next big thing for us is the our golf outing at Ruffle Feathers. And so, you know, we want people, to, if they love the golf and want that experience and you know, come out and have a good time, yo, just, uh, we always have a good time. And it's not always, Jason, like the, I would say the, the, the big names for us, it's always about a good time and people always want to come back and enjoy themselves. So, you know, people can go to all like my social media platforms and figure out how they can kind of figure out, see if you would like to come out to the Audi. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, and uh, your coffee's a jewel. Is that right? <laughs> yes, jewel. I need to add a hundred. Man. <laughs> yeah, man. Add, add jewel, man. You can go get it anywhere. Any jewel Osco, you can go get it. We're in some high Z's in uh in the, the Wisconsin area as oh, well in Iowa. Well. So we're, yeah, we're we're moving. We're moving some product, man. So it's a good thing. No, that's good. Trish and I are going to go and uh, and grab some because Jewel is across the street. So I uh, I didn't realize it was a Jewel until I went to the website. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm sure what uh, a lot of people who are tuning into the show uh, want to hear about, or at least your opinion. I don't know if they care what mine is. Um, uh, the the Bears' recent draft, um, and I have to say, you know, I think we've known each other for a long time. And, you know, we obviously talked a lot of Bears football. I mean, Brennan and I, that's all we talked about three days a week for a year and a half. So if anyone is like, why do you talk about the Bears so much? Well, I don't know. I feel like now it's in my like in my spine or something like it's a part of my body. Uh, But, you know, every year when they when they hire a new coach or they fire a coordinator or they have one good draft pick or one marquee, really pricey free agent signing. I feel like we always have this, you know, I don't want to call it faith and I don't want to call it optimism. It was like hope, this deep hope that like these things were going to happen. And then we almost talk ourselves into like, it's going to be great. I, it just, cause I think we are so sick of it not being that way that we talked ourselves into it. All that being said, like, this is the first off season in, I could, I'm going to say 15 years that I'm like, Every step they make, it's like, okay, all right. You know, our team is like obviously trying to modernize <laughs> and change the way it, you know, it drafts, the way they work out, like everything. Everything in one off season makes me feel better than I have, and I can't remember how long. What do you, what's? And I think you've been around Hallis Hall. Like, what's the what's the vibe there? Um, you know, it's a. I think it's a different vibe. I think even think from last year there was a different vibe because I think guys are starting to believe that that they can play with anybody when you have guys like Jordan Howard and it was so funny around Super Bowl time when we were you know there for the Super Bowl in Minnesota and just you know hearing some of those comments of Jordan Howard talking about the team and where he thinks they're going to be and people were kind of like oh you're crazy well I mean that's one of the things that you have to tip your cap to when you think about John Fox is that 
yeah, the record might not be is what you probably hoped for when he was hired, but he left the Bears in a better place than oh. how he found it. And, oh my! I mean, that's I mean, he, yeah. He, said, he, he was he was he was instrumental in really putting guys in a in a mindset that listen, you're good enough, you can make this happen. And I think you, know, you look around the NFL and all these teams, and you know people are playing the people that are playing. NFL football, I don't care if it's for a year or a game, if you're there, you're wearing a jersey, you're doing something, and you're a part of a small percentage of people that ever get a chance to play at that level. But not only just having that, it's about having the mindset that, listen, I can play here, and you start to build a culture. And I think that's what we're starting to see, you know, now that's starting to develop a little bit is this culture inside of the locker room, which is totally different when I started covering this team and not just being a fan but covering them it's totally right. different now it's night and day and you're adding new pieces to the puzzle that are pieces that can actually be you know good football players and 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 that's the that's the thing and this I think this draft kind of solidified for me that now this is what I wanted Ryan Pace to do from the beginning is go in the first round pick the best player that's available and not worry about the upside on this guy and, oh, he could be this. No, pick a football player that's going to come in day one when they enter into your organization and step at, you know, into your facility and that can play football. His fourth draft, he found out a way to be able to get Roquan Smith and a guy that is coming into your program and he's going to be there and not just be a guy that, you know, is going to come in and play right away. He's going to do that. But he's an instant leader inside of your locker room. You're, now you're adding more leaders inside of this locker room. To me, it's pretty scary to see what Ryan Pace has done in this offseason. Now you just got to sit and hope that the one thing and the one issue that we've seen over the last couple of years with injuries doesn't affect kind of what this year could be for the Chicago Bears. Right. You know, and I know when Matt came on uh, Sports Feed, and I, I have something funny that I want to ask you about regarding uh, his appearance on the show. But uh, when he came on, he was mentioning that he and I were talking on on uh, AFD show about the draft. And Matt doesn't you know, he's not sitting around watching tape like I, I'm a weirdo. I mean, I've watched probably the top 35 prospects videos like over the off season on YouTube because I wanted to like I had no reason. And, you know, but we just said all we want in this draft is someone who comes in and starts day one and is like an every down player. Like, I, you know, he's like, I don't care if it's offensive line. I don't care if it's wide receiver. I don't care what it is. As long as the person comes in and plays like day one and is not like a role player or a project or stuff. And I, I that's exactly what Roquan is, man. He is amazing. Like, I, I am so pumped to see that guy on the field. Yeah, I mean, he's a he's a difference maker. And, you know, people want to talk about his size and this and that. Well, I mean, the day, the game is changing right before our eyes every single year. And as you – you, people are so fixated here in this city on Brian Erlacher, and rightfully so. I mean, he's right. going into the Hall of Fame. No disrespect. But when it comes down to it, man, the game's changing. And – you need guys that can get sideline to sideline and play football, and I think that's what Roquan is. He's a guy that he gives you that opportunity to, to have a guy on the football field that not only is a good football player, he's just a smart guy. And I think over time, he's only going to get better. And uh, yep. You know, the, the, but the relationship though, Jay, with with him, Roquan and Vic Fangio, I think is what's. I'm looking forward to, and I think what could be super special is because of his track record with, you know, turning linebackers into special players. You know, you look at what he did in in San Francisco, but he's actually getting a first-round draft pick, a guy that played in a national championship, that played in the SEC, uh, SEC Defensive Player of the Year, Buckets Award winner. I mean, this is a top talent. I think that relationship and watching Roquan grow underneath Vic Fangio and his teachings to me, I think was what's most exciting 
about having him here in Chicago. Right. I mean, it's it's not it's it's pretty far and few between. We get someone who, you know, and it's I I don't know I don't think it's very it's fair necessarily to him to be you know this guy is like he's anointed. I mean, they're already interviewing Dick Buckus and Mike Singletary and Brian Urlacher, and what are they going to say? You know, like uh, well, he's got a lot to prove. You know, they're like, oh yeah, he could be the next monster of the Midway. So I, as much as as much fun as that is, like I just want this this poor kid to put on some shoulder pads and a Bears jersey and and. uh learn the system <laughs> before he has that truckload of pressure put on his back. But I, it's, it's, it's so cool. Uh, the other day we were out, uh, I was, I was having a beer with, uh, with a couple of friends and uh, some guy, you know, there's always the guy out who's complaining about, about the bears pick. And you could tell he doesn't really watch football uh, outside of like maybe the bears games. And he was like, the guy is so small. I don't think he's going to play. Like, how tall is he? And I said, let, let, I'll tell you what, buddy. I'm like, let's call him six foot. Who cares? Have you watched him play? Like, that guy, he, he is an absolute freak, man. He plays, he plays like a big safety. You play that guy in nickel, he's going to be able to cover everybody. He's, he never has to come off the field. He's smart enough. He's going to be, you know, I think he's going to take over play calling duties from Trevathan. You know, I just, it's, it's exciting. Like he's not someone that it's like, well, let's just rotate him in and hope he gets a sack. Like this guy is starting middle linebacker day one. Yeah. And that's what, that's what you want. And I think for Ryan Pace, it's, that's been his Achilles heel through this process of, of selecting players that first round, he really had to, his first three drafts, he's had to go with finding guys with upside and you know now we've seen him in later rounds where he's found gems of guys yeah. you know Jordan Howard, Tariq Cohen but now I think things are starting to shape together and I just look forward to watching these guys on the football field uh, this summer man I, I can't wait for football to get here. I know I haven't been down to camp in a while I want to I need to get down there and check it out and just because I I know Bourbon A is just they they treat them so well, and everybody has such a good time. So I definitely want to go check that out this year. When you're watching, so I, you know, I'm obsessively watching the draft. I'm sure you were doing it, maybe, but you had kids also. Like I had nothing. I was just sitting there watching it, by my, <laughs> or making my poor wife watch it. But as like you know, the first three picks happen, uh, and I was texting with Matt, and, te- and my brothers texting me, and they're all asking me questions. And I actually knew about all these people, and I just said, guys, I'm telling you right now, picks one, two, and three are all going to be starting. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be starting from day one. We do not usually have that happen for us in rounds one through three. It's usually like the random guys in round four or five that someone gets hurt and they end up on the field and then never give that job back up. But, I mean, as far as Roquan, James Daniels, and Anthony Miller, they're, I, I think um, they're like day one starters. I think Miller will be your starting, starting slot guy. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I look at, you know, James Daniels, uh, anytime that you're telling me you're getting the offensive lineman from the big Iowa. for Iowa <laughs> yeah. or, or Wisconsin, I mean, I don't think he really can go wrong with that. His versatility I think is what kind of sets him apart. Uh, I would like for him to kind of get locked in at guard just to keep Cody White here at, at center and let him kind of grow there. And I just think the relationship with White here and, and Mitchell Trubisky is so big that you want him to have that feel comfortable when he's underneath center. And I think on the other side, on the flip side, it comes down to you know how long and can he stay healthy for an entire season. If he can do that, that interior of that line could be pretty, pretty special. On the flip side with Anthony Miller, though, man, he – you look at his tape and you just put it on and he just jumps out at you, man. He's a guy that's six foot, but – under six foot, but plays bigger than his size. And you got to love that. Plus, he gives you that ability to inside to do so many different things. And I think now you're adding so much to a new offense that is going to look totally different, and you're adding more pieces to the puzzle. That just makes it harder for defenses to kind of scheme and figure out how they're going to play you. And so with that, now you're going to get a kid in Miller. And I said this today, I mean, we could have the defensive rookie of the year and possibly the offensive rookie of the year if he's not he'll be in that conversation uh of the top four Miller will be when I think the season ends yeah well I think (laughs) I think unless uh unless uh 
Saquon Barkley decides to move to another planet, I think he might be uh, <laughs> at the, the, the favorite uh, at this point. But, you know, I definitely think that Miller is going to surprise some people. And, you know, people have been starting to watch video on him. I mean, it's just cool. I don't know if you, I was reading the series um, in the Sun-Times where they talk with uh, the co- their position coaches. And uh, uh, Miller's wide receiver coach was saying, he's like, in all my years of coaching football, I've never had a player ask me to play on all four special teams units. <laughs> he's like, the guy, you know, he asked to be on special teams. He's a four-phase guy. He, he likes being a slot guy. He doesn't mind. He likes bodying out bigger players. Like, he, that's his thing. He, he will outwork you. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I know he's playing at Memphis, but – you know, look at any of these guys that we drafted in later rounds. You know, they play against smaller, uh, or I don't want to say lower level, but, you know, it's just a different level of competition. But they also play those teams. Like when you look at some of these guys, and we'll, we'll dig down a little bit, but some of these guys, you know, they'll show you watch their highlight tapes. They're playing Alabama. You know, they're playing Big Ten teams. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know, West, you know, like Western Kentucky and, and Memphis and some of these guys aren't playing like the Giants all the time, but these guys show up on tape when they do, and I think that's what the scouts are seeing. Yeah, I mean, that's the big part. You just want you want guys to be able to come in and have an instant impact, and Brian Pace talked about that before his first combine, about how he was looking for playmakers, and I think that's what you're starting to see with uh, some of these draft picks over the last couple of years, guys that are making plays, these are playmakers, and those guys have the ability to change the dynamics of a football game. Man, yeah, when we when we drafted Jordan Howard, I texted Matt, and I said, he's going to be our starting running back. And he's like, really? I said, I, I promise you. Promise you. Like, I, <laughs> I watched him at Indiana. Like, he, he was just better than everybody. And then uh, last year, I was like, Eddie Jackson, he's going to be a starter. I I, and he's like, really? Didn't he break his leg? I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> it's fixed. He's going to be a starter. So, like, the fact that he is able to find these guys, you know, and I think he has some amount of faith in injury history because, you know, that's been killing us the last five seasons. But some of these guys, I mean, some players get hurt. They never get better. A lot of these guys get hurt. Somehow they end up being better. You know, it's just... You got sometimes you have to roll the dice, and I just feel like the skill sets of these players, it's not just potential. I, like, you can see that they're going to be able to contribute early on, which, you know, thank God. Uh, you know, I just I can't, I can't take any more beatings. You know, I'm not expecting a Super Bowl, but just maybe give me eight wins or something so I'm not depressed. Uh, <laughs> okay, wait, have you on the show had to pronounce uh, Iggy's name yet? Because I, I don't try to do it. Or, uh, yeah, our... <laughs> I've tried, and uh, I keep always kind of messing it up. But uh, I think it's I, I can't Ibuni, even Ibuni way. Ibuni way is that Ibuni way? Yeah. Ibuni okay. Way. So Iggy, um, our fourth round pick, linebacker from Western Kentucky. You know that was the first time that I saw anyone in the media, and of course people on Twitter go nuts, um, saying you know we needed to get a. Uh, we needed to get a pass rusher, an edge guy. Well, yeah, we did. But unfortunately, edge was bad in free agency and worse in the draft after you get past the you know top three prospects. So I'm not going to say I knew anything about this guy. And then I started watching some some video on him, man. He's a he's a beast. You know, he plays really he plays like Roquan. You know, obviously, they're in uh, different skill sets in terms of like competition they played against it. But I have a feeling that those two are going to be our starting middle guys within a year. Trevathan, yeah. I know his contract is coming up. He's having some, you know, he has some health problems. I, I think that this guy is going to be better than Kwiatkowski. Like, do you, I, do you see that? I, I see that happening. Joel E.A. Booneyway. Yes. E.A. Booneyway. Yes. I listen, you look at him. He was born in Chicago. He was raised in Bolingbrook. Bolingbrook, so, yeah. And he's got, yeah, so he knows and understands, like, you know, what it's all about and what Bears defense means to uh, this team. He he played outside in 2016. So he was, you know, he's not, when you look at his frame, not super big, but I also look at him and he moved, started to play inside. So he can kind of do, he can do all these different things. His size is a little bit because his frame is not so big. Right. I honestly 
J I honestly believe that like somehow when you look at him not being his size, they try to make him into a safety. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm yeah. telling you right now. He could, well, he can come down but he can come down and I guess in different sub, sub packages he could play a lot of different positions. So just by his size. So I look at him in that way. I love the fact that he plays with a reckless abandon. And I think that's what jumps off the screen when you watch him. He He's another guy that plays bigger than his size and seems like a smart football player and super, super athletic. And I think mean, that's the reason why, that his versatility is what is going to make a guy like Vic Fangio and his defensive staff kind of drool and go, man, how can we use him? Because he's, it, it's so, there's so many different ways we can use him, and I think that's what's going to give him an opportunity, hopefully, to to become a special player. Yeah, and I think you know because um, of that ability, and because of the fact that Fangio probably plays nickel the most. I mean, there are going to yep. be some times where some of these guys who are, you know, fringe size wise linebacker safeties, but like you said, this guy like delivers hits, man. So like, I just I love it because I just think that Vic. I, this is, I think, the first year off season that you could see some puzzle pieces for him. You know, I don't know that he's felt like he f- had had a, a stacked deck. And we know we've th- obviously we've had depth problems. So players like this, I can just see him getting ex- like pumped up about. So I like, you know, and then watching the the some tape on this kid, man. Woo! Like I know he's going to be going against bigger, faster guys, but I, I mean, I think at the very least. Chris Tabor's got to be doing cartwheels because can you imagine this kid on special teams? Like <laughs> he's, he, I mean, they're changing the rules for players like him. I think you know, <laughs> like that guy. I would not want to have to deal with that guy coming down the field at me. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing, man. I, I like the fact that he does have more puzzle pieces to kind of work with now, and I think that's where he can get more creative and find new ways to be able to use guys, which should be fun. Bilal Nichols. Our defensive, well, I guess you call him defensive lineman, defensive tackle, defensive end, because I have a feeling they'll, I think he's athletic enough that he'll play all three spots. Another guy that I'm not going to say, you know, I, I do I know Delaware players? Absolutely not. But, you know, now that we have access to the interwebs, I was able to go <laughs> watch him play and watch a lot of his highlights. Um, they they really did line him up all over the place. I mean, and I there was yeah. an interview with his position coach at Delaware just talking about the fact that they could put him anywhere a guy would get hurt a guy would get gassed he'd go in and then he became the starter nice thing is though even though he's kind of like the bowling ball guy in the middle who's gonna hold off blocks and try to uh uh, try to collapse the pocket he can generate pressure like the guy is a legitimate pass rush threat from the from the interior so like i don't know i it's just another one of those things where you don't know their name firsthand but what are the odds of anyone knowing fourth fifth sixth and seventh round prospects really, who's just a general fan. And I watch a lot of tape and a lot of games, and I don't know who these guys are, but now that I've watched and see like what they're all about, how they play and how they were used, I can see how they fit into Fangio's system. So, like, it's just another smart, you know, it's just it's just like these little pieces, you know? I mean, I think, honestly, if, uh, say, if Jonathan Bullard doesn't start playing, I think he can. Like, I liked him coming out of Florida. I think he's still got it. Uh, I, you know, he, I think he's had people in front of him. Now they're gone. Like, the job is his to lose. But I feel like Nichols is going to be a big rotation piece. I think he's going to be on the field a lot. I hope so. Yeah, I think you got that's what you're hoping for. And Payson just talked about it, that, you know, for his size, how athletic he is. And I think that's what you, you like is that he's one of those guys that's a little doesn't, you know, shy away from getting dirty. And, and I love that about him. And he is. There's some upside there. He's got to figure out a way to be able to kind of dominate. When he was at Delaware, they kind of switched around to that three-man front. So he found himself with a lot of double teams, and he wasn't able to kind of, you know, have the production that he had the year prior to that. But – you know, these are the things where you get a guy to come in and fit into your system, what you're trying to do. And that that's, to me, what the Bears are doing. And I remember having this conversation with Sean Davis, and he mentioned this to me, and I've kind of stuck with it about how, you know, the Bears are really trying to take that system of the New England Patriots and, like, have where it doesn't matter, you know, where you come from, but if you build a system that can be, you know, sustainable – man, then you could just plug and put guys in and you can do that. And, you know, with the Bears spending time with, you know, over the last couple of years of spending time of practicing preseason with 
the Patriots. They had a chance to go down there and watch how they do business and how they work. And that's what they're trying to do. And if you can you can create that, man, that gives you the opportunity to have something special with a, with a team and with the whole entire unit. Right. And, you know, and un- not unfortunately, you know, the way that it's been in the past and, you know, yes, we're the Bears. We're the most tenured franchise. George Hallis started the NFL. All that stuff is very important to me and it always will be. You know, I, I love, I bleed the bear. I love the Bears, but you know, and it's bear culture and bear weather and all this stuff. It's like, you know, all that stuff is just like, it's just words and it's just talk. Like the teams who have been winning the last several years, Patriots being like the, the gold, the gold standard of it. It's not just a culture. It's a, it's a system. Like you walk in the door and it's, th- it's this way. This is how it works. This is where, how we're going to use you. Learn how to be better. And then we'll give you more stuff to do. You know, like it's just... I, and I feel like that's kind of happening. You know, I mean, like Matt may be a first time coach, but he does not. The only time he seems and I don't even want to say flustered, but the only time he seems like a rookie is when he gets the questions about what it's like to coach the whole team versus the offense. And he's like, man, you know, yeah. like it's all about time management. I mean, like and of course, he's never had the job, but he learned from someone who's very good at the job. So but I mean, it's just he seems like he stepped in. He took charge. He told Ryan what he needed. Ryan went and got it. And now, like, okay, here's your toys. Go play with them. Go go win some games. So, it, you know, that's what it feels like to me. The funny thing is the next guy we drafted, I actually knew who he was, which I, I don't know why. Like, I'm, I might be the only guy in the Chicagoland area who knew who Kylie Fitz was because – I remember, like, right when, right back when he started college, he was like highly recruited. And he went to UCLA, and I, you know, for one reason or another, he didn't end up getting playing time, and then he transferred to Utah. But like, I remember his name so well because I watched a lot of Pac-12 football, and like when he was on the field, whoever was calling the games would be like, "This guy, man, if he was not hurt so much, if he was not hurt so much, because if you look at him, like he's faster than everybody that he's out there playing with. He's huge." The guy is super strong. I mean, I, I, like any plays that he's been in, you watch him just body like the offensive lineman into the quarterback. And then he's got like that natural bend. So, you know, for him, like the injuries, that's what sucks. But at the same time, if he could be healthy, you know, the first player that came to mind was, uh, remember Mark Anderson back in, what was that, 06? I think we drafted him. Yeah. Use this, use this guy just on passing downs for a little while just to see what he can do. I mean, you bring in a six four two sixty three guy who's running a four five five, you know, to rush the passer on third down. I mean, I think some good things could happen given his skill set. Yeah, you just want the biggest thing is make sure that he stays healthy. If he can stay healthy, it gives you an opportunity to be able to be in there and make plays. And I mean, that's where. You know, the issue with him, can he stay healthy? If he can do that, it's going to give him that chance. And all he needs is a chance. And once you get there, you sniff that NFL for the first time, man. It's a it's a powerful drug. You don't ever want to leave. So you got to do everything you can to be able to stay on the football field. And I think that's kind of the biggest issue for, for most guys, especially guys that have injury history coming out of college. Right. And the unfortunate thing is, I mean, I, as you're listening to the draft, it, I, I swear it felt like everybody did, right? Like, did you, I, I didn't hear anyone when they were, you know, when Mayock and Jeremiah and Charles Davis are going through it saying like, yeah, he was healthy for four straight years. You know, it's always like, man, he got, you know, he had a something with his knee, both knees, shoulders. Like, I mean, it's, you, you played the sport, you know, <laughs> you know what it is. So, I mean, it's, I think once they get into the NFL, hopefully they, they learn how to have an NFL body. They learn how to condition better. Um, you know, for someone like him, you know, if, if he's rotational and situational, he's not he's not in there every down. He's not taking that pounding. So maybe that'll be good for him, too. The last guy we drafted. Though, so what are your thoughts on whims? Like, I mean, I it seems like he, I don't know if I've heard he had like off the field problems, but it sounded like he had. I don't really like to work problems kind of throughout his career. And, you know, I, I started to notice him later in the season. Big dude you know, huge catch radius. Um, I don't, I, I really didn't see him run any routes other than just post, <laughs> just go, you know? Uh, so well, I, you, I mean, it's you can, not a big sample size. Yeah. I mean, you can see though, I mean, I'll take guys that come from Georgia as well. I, I, oh, yeah. I think sometimes things, things definitely change over time, but I mean, kid grew up playing basketball. So he does, he knows how to go up and get the football and you got to just love 
his size. And I think just adding to what this Bears offense is going to look like, man, be able to have him to maybe find a way to break in, if if not, or just have that depth that th- that's there. I mean, I don't think you can go wrong. I, you see him run, you know, straight go routes, but then, you know, I watched some some, some tape too, or just watching him. He's got good hands, and I think yeah. that's what. Oh, he's a hand catcher. For, I know that's so weird to say, <laughs> but he is. <laughs> he's got good hands, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing if he has an opportunity to show his talents as well, because he's athletic enough to be able to play. I mean, I mean, let's let's be honest. You look at the Bears wide receivers last year. I mean, oh boy. He, if he was on this roster, there would be an opportunity for him to be able to to get some shine. So I hope he does, and I think he can because I like his game. I think there would have been an opportunity for me to get a chance last year. It was it was that it was that dire. Like it was, oh my god. You know, I'm just like, who are we gonna? Who are we literally gonna sign off the street just to <laughs> just to, just to play wide receiver? <laughs> I'm wondering. I just I have a feeling that he'll. If he can prove himself worthy on special teams, because that's really what it is for the wide receivers at like the bottom of the roster. Like they need you to be good at special teams. Same with uh, defensive backs and same with linebackers, but wide receivers especially. Like if, I mean, because Bellamy's kind of got that spot locked down, but I think this kid's a better wide receiver. You know, it's just I think cut down day is going to be harder than it's been in a very long time at the end of this preseason. And that's like the coolest thing, right? Like we don't want it to be like, well, those two guys stink. So it's obvious. Like you want it to be, man, you know, like they're both really good. So, and I think that's, that's what this off season feels like. To me. Yeah. And I think it's at a, a good, good point right now where, you know, this organization is moving in the right direction and they made some, some really good acquisitions, whether it was in during the draft or through free agency that are definitely going to help out. And I think we're going to get a chance to see an offense, and especially an offense here in Chicago that we've never seen before, man, wide open, and I'm looking forward to it. Well, literally never, 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 you know? And that's since the uh, the T formation, and that was quite a while ago. Uh, so have we seen, like, anything innovative? But or Well, maybe March tried, but, you know, they don't they, – they no, it's hard to have personnel to, to do the Mike Martz offense. A couple of dudes – you know, we draft. I think we signed fifteen undrafted guys. But I, do you, what? What do you think of Ryan Nall? Like, I actually have seen him play a little bit, and that guy—he's a big dude, man. I think he might make the team. Well, I mean, I think the best way is like you were talking about before: special teams. Can you show a way to be able to do that? I mean, the, the backfield is kind of crowded as it is right now. So, right. you know, how many? How many running backs are they going to keep? You know, Benny Cunningham, I see, is going to be around. He's dependable on third down. So can you find a way for them to justify keeping more running backs, which most of the time doesn't happen. They want to keep more wide receivers than anything. So I think you're right about cut down day. It's going to come down to to some – it's going to be tough for all those guys to figure out how they're going to shorten this roster. But I think he, he does. He gives you the – this – the inside game, which is, I just, I love the fact of how you can have a guy that can, you know, run the football, have good vision, good feet, be a little bit big and like, you know, have a little bulk to you and be able to run, man. To me, we're, we're nowadays, you know, offenses, we're not relying on one just running back to take you the whole entire season. I mean, right. the teams that are successful have those running backs by committee. And if you can find your way into the committee, man, that's what you're looking for now, even though Jordan Howard's still the guy. He, 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 now you got a guy like Tariq Cohen that's here as well, and that takes off a little bit of pressure on Jordan Howard. But then now you're, you start adding some more pieces, man. I look forward to seeing how Jordan Howard and Tariq Cohen benefit from Matt Nagy's offense. Oh, the, the zone blocking scheme. And, you know, like like you said, the offseason acquisitions were great. and The draft was great. But the coaching hiring process was great. I mean, like you bring in he stand. I, I, I feel like just him being in the building makes us better. And that's rare. You don't say that much about coaches. Yeah. But I mean, I was that like, I'm like we got we got him back. Yes. You know, like who, who, who cheers for the offensive line coach other than like meatballs like me. But <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, like, we've, so we've fired through the whole draft. We've gone through the offseason and stuff. And, uh, you know, lots, of, I think, lots of things to be optimistic about. Obviously, this is all on paper. You know, like Fox used to say, we, the, we, we haven't even seen him in shorts yet. 
So, uh, <laughs> but I'm a uh, man, I don't know. I, I don't know what I can predict and I generally don't do it anyway as, as like a win loss record, but I just feel like the well, showing... don't, do don't do it. Don't do it. No, I don't. Yeah, I mean, don't. it's, I, it's like, it's like the day after the draft. I, I just see all these dorks posting about like, like fantasy stuff already. I'm like, these rookies haven't played a down of football. Like, settle down with your fantasy football rankings. <laughs> like, it's just, you know, it's all, this is all, like, exciting for us, but it's not actual football yet. <laughs> so, what did I want to, oh, what I wanted to bring up to you. So, when Matt was on Sports Feed, what was that, a couple months ago? Maybe? Yeah, a couple know, months not, ago. Time, time's going so fast, I don't even know what day it is. But uh, he, <laughs> I was laughing so hard every time he would come back on camera because, uh, I mean, like, what were your thoughts of like his chest hair taking over the studio? Like, it was the the gear he had on, like the ground beef was showing, man. <laughs> hey, I mean, that's what it's all about. If I had some taco meat, I would want to show it too. You know what I mean? But I don't. I don't got it. I can't. Do it. I was laughing so hard. I'm like, Trish, come in here. Look at Matt's chest hair. You know, like you would think it was, it would be about the content, but <laughs> I couldn't get beyond it. It just cracked me up, man. You like, uh, you just look like, like, I don't know, like a bouncer at an Italian restaurant or something. Just <laughs> <laughs> talking to you about football. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I, I mean, I've, I've kept your time. I've kept you long enough. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you taking the time to go through all this stuff with me. And like I said, let's, uh, we definitely need to, uh, to catch up outside of, uh, well, I don't know if I would call myself in the biz, you know, I guess podcasting is kind of like the biz. So, <laughs> but something in a non-interview. Yeah, let's do it, man. I would definitely enjoy it. I appreciate you for having me on anytime I can talk bears, um, especially with you. I know how much you love the bears, so it makes it even that much more cool. So I appreciate it. All right, buddy. So uh, uh, you can catch Jared Payton Sunday through Thursday nights on Sportsfeed on CLT TV, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Doing the sports on the 4 p.m. newscast for WGN. And what else? Anything else? No, yeah. I mean, like, obviously you're doing a lot of stuff outside of work, too. So, but they're not going to catch you there. Uh, <laughs> and um, as far as, is it the Jared Payton Foundation or is it the Walter Payton for the golf outing at Ruffled Feathers? Uh, Jared Payton Foundation and jaredpayton.org. That's where you can find out all the information. Okay. And Jared does lots of stuff, including the Rise and Grind uh, tweets every morning for the, uh, it's, it's Peyton Coffee. You can find him at, at Peyton Sun, and you can find out about the coffee at, at Peyton Coffee. Jared, again, thank you so much for joining, man. And we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll be talking all throughout uh, the day tomorrow on, uh, on the Twitter machine because uh, well, I'm going to launch the episode tomorrow morning. All right, cool, man. I appreciate it. All right, buddy, man. Take it easy.